appreciate everyone who has made the effort to come out today, braving the elements that are out there. And also should mention from time to time, you know, we have uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 people that log in each week and view our assembly and we welcome them and appreciate their interest as well. But uh, it's good to be um, in the face-to-face -face assembly and, and to see all of you. Um, again, today there is uh, sheets. Are they passed out? Are they working on it? They're just coming in now. There we go. Um, if you weren't here last week, we had one of these um, to help you with the sermon. We're doing a little bit of heavy lifting, heavier than normal in our uh, lesson time. And so there's a little bit more detail on our sermon handout. And we're referring to a lot of scripture and covering a lot of ground as we build to some important choices in the church here. And I think it's important to have a good foundation for such things. And so I um, encourage you to have your copy of scripture, whether it's paper or electronic, whatever it is, to follow along because we'll make reference to a lot of different passages as we go. But just uh, glad that you're able to be here today. So last Sunday we began this study concerning the ministry of the church. That's what we're talking about, the ministry of the church. And uh, we began by noticing how our Lord said that, that his kingdom would not be like the kingdoms of the world that they were familiar with at that time. His kingdom would not have rulers that lorded it over the subjects. In fact, he said that in order to be great in his kingdom, one would have to be a servant, that the great ones would be servants. The greatest in the kingdom of God, he said, would be the servant of all. I see that among God's people all the time. Um, you know, I was teaching the class out here in the auditorium this morning, and the doors were open back there, so I, I sort of saw the weather coming in. It, it started about halfway through class, and, and I noticed that, uh, I don't know who it was, but maybe it was more than one person preparing the steps out there with salt and multiple times in that 20 minutes or so. And I just thought, you know, that is needed service. And it's humble service. And uh, that's the kind of thing that goes on in God's kingdom when it is functioning. It's not the only kind of service, but it's a, important because we don't want anybody falling down the steps or slipping or anything. And hopefully no one did and hopefully no one will. Be careful when you leave. But we... We have somebody that was, that was serving us in that way. That's great. That's great in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is the one who said so. So we, we talked about that last week. Let's see here. Do we have? There we are. Then we looked at um, the church in prophecy by studying a little bit in the book of Daniel. Uh, in particular in Daniel chapter 2, if you remember King Nebuchadnezzar had this very troubling dream um, that when, when Daniel interpreted it, it laid out the history of the world from that time until the time of Jesus and, and the New Testament church. And we saw how that dream showed the succession of kingdoms one after the other from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, and so had the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then into the New Testament times to the Romans of Jesus' day, and, and how, as this dream was interpreted, it was said that in those days, that is the days of the last kingdom, the Romans, that God would raise up another kingdom, that is his kingdom, that would outlast all of the rest and would defeat all of the rest. And it would never be defeated, this, this new kingdom. In fact, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And then we noticed how John the Baptist spoke of this kingdom as drawing near during his preaching ministry, and how Jesus himself did the exact same thing. 
And then the earthly expression of that kingdom, the church, we saw how it came in power on the day of Pentecost. We can read about that in Acts chapter 2. What happened that day in Jerusalem. Such an important day in our history. What I want us to do this morning is to begin to see how God has organized His church for ministry. And I just underline again the, the important starting point in all of this the important attitude that we need to have as people in the kingdom, and that is the attitude of servants. We have to start there before we talk about these other things. That God intends His people to be humble servants. He has organized His servants for ministry. Scripture is very clear about that. And and we want to, as best we can, be what Scripture describes. That's what we want to do. And so that's why we take this seriously. God has prepared, organized, and gifted His church for ministry. One of the best places to start with this is in the letter to the Ephesians, book of Ephesians chapter 4. In this chapter, the Apostle Paul talks about the famous seven ones in verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 4. And so he talks about one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and then one God and Father of all. And so you have this emphasis on oneness, unity, and that's clearly a theme in this important chapter, Ephesians 4. The first in this list of ones, notice, is one body. Clearly, that is a reference to the church because the church is described as the body of Christ. And notice that there is one, one body. So how has God organized that body as it relates to the work of that body? Verses 11 and following will tell us a lot about that. How God has organized us for ministry. God gave the church five offices, we might say. If you don't like the word office, pick another one. It doesn't really matter. But we might say five roles, five gifts, but there are five mentioned here in this passage. And before we list them, It's important, again, to see what they're there for. What are these five supposed to help the church do? That's in verse 12. What does verse 12 say? To equip the saints for what? The work of ministry. These five, their purpose is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's what they're meant to accomplish. To get the church to minister to get the church to serve, to prod them on to the work of ministry. This word diakonia. Remember we talked about that word last week. Um, Diakonos, servant, minister, sometimes translated deacon. Um, This ministry is, is what the apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers are tasked with getting the rest of us to do. In the church. This is their job. And a person might say, you know, I thought that uh, those people, that is those offices, like teachers, deacons, elders, I thought they were supposed to do the work. No, no. No, no, no. Inasmuch as they too are members of the church, as the, as in as much as they are members of the body of Christ, they're like all Christians. They're called to minister. They're called to serve and should be serving as good, humble servants. But they were not appointed to be the only workers in the kingdom. It's actually quite the opposite of that. They're, in fact, given the task of getting the entire church, every member, 
every, every baptized believer to do Christian ministry. And, and here, I think, is where we have so often missed it in the church over the years. There are no spectators in the church. Now, that line is, is worth the price of admission this morning. I could just say that and then go home and you'd probably be satisfied. But let me say it again. There are no spectators in the church. There, there are to be no sideline observers of ministry going on where, where some are serving and some don't. No. All serve. All have a role in the ministry of the church. And if you are a member of the church and if you don't have a role, a service, that is a real problem. Not only for the church, but for you. If you don't have a service or a ministry because you're rebelling against what God wants you to do, you are in spiritual danger, in fact, and will answer to God. This is serious business. So before we talk about these special roles or offices, let's make sure we understand their purpose, and that's to help the rest of us serve in the kingdom of Jesus. In order that the church might be built up, and in order that we might be unified in the faith and become mature in the faith. See, that's the rest of verses 12 and 13 of our text there in Ephesians chapter 4. So what did God give the church in order to accomplish these goals? He gave the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. Now, I don't think that's an exhaustive list of everything that God gave the church. It's not a 100% these five only, um, but it's a good representative list by the Apostle Paul here. We can read in other places in the New Testament. For instance, we can read about the office, if you want to call it that, of deacon in the church of our Lord. So this list doesn't list everything, uh, but it is an important list. The list of five here in Ephesians, I think we can divide into two basic groups as we're just trying to organize our thought around it. And that would be temporary roles and per permanent roles. Temporary and permanent among these five. And for today in our study, we're, we're just going to look at the two temporary roles. So we're talking about apostles and prophets. First, apostles. The word is simply brought over into English directly from the Greek. There's a Greek word, apostolos. And as you can hear, that's where we get our word apostle. Its basic meaning was one who is sent. One who is sent out, usually under divine authority, sending them. Okay? It could refer to a lot of things. It could refer to a messenger that is sent. It could be an envoy. It could, uh, in relation to God's church, be a missionary. Um, several different people are referred to as apostles in the New Testament. And this is something sometimes we don't think about, but we need to. Even Jesus is called an apostle. If you look at uh, just a few verses after where uh, Eric read for us this morning in, in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. You say, I didn't know Jesus was an apostle. Well, in this sense, he was. In what sense? God sent him. He's a sent one, you see. God sent Jesus with a mission. And so in that sense, um, Jesus is an apostle. Another one like that is Barnabas. If you um, study the life of Barnabas or read about him uh, over Acts chapter 14, you know, we don't often think of Barnabas as an apostle, but he was in the sense that he was sent out on a mission. Uh, 
2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23 is another example where the word is used of messengers that Paul and his mission team used in their work. They were sent. See, you have, you have a message, you send it with somebody that, in that sense, is an apostolos, uh, an apostle. So there, there is this generic sense of the term, and, and I suppose you know, we could call someone today who is sent out with a mission an apostle in this sense, though it's probably best to avoid confusion and uh, refer to them as a messenger or, or something like that instead. But as I'm sure you know, there was a more specific and unique use of this term in the first century that Jesus apparently coined uh, to refer specifically to his selected group of 12. 12 men who led and taught the church in its infancy, whom we refer to as the apostles of Christ. We know their names. They're listed multiple times in the New Testament. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Andrew, Thomas, Bartholomew. I could probably ask the kids. They, they would know this even better. James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, and Judas. Judas, of course, betrays the Lord, takes his own life, and he is replaced in the apostolate. Uh, he's replaced um, by, among the twelve by Matthias. We can read about that event in Acts chapter 1. So Matthias becomes one of the apostles. And then eventually there came an apostle um, born out of due time, he says, in, uh, in his own words. That's the apostle Paul. And you can read that language over in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8. But other than these 13 or 14, depending on how you count them, there were no others that held this special temporary office in the church. And there have been none since. And there are none today. Okay? Some claim to be. There are people today that claim to be apostles. They do so completely without biblical authority. And they ought to be highly suspicious to us. Jesus gives great authority in the establishment of the church to his chosen apostles. Great authority. For example, listen to these words of Jesus. This is from Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 28. He's speaking to these men and he says, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's sort of a poetic way of, of Jesus saying, you're going to lead my church. All right? They had great influence and authority. You might remember better the, the commissioning of the twelve at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus gives them authority. Great authority. He sends them on a mission. He tells them to make disciples, to baptize and to teach. And they did it. They fulfilled their roles. These men had to meet special qualifications. And sometimes in these, these roles, these offices in the church, special qualifications need to be met. This was the case with the apostles. Uh, we learn what their qualifications were in Acts chapter 1 when they're having to replace Judas. Judas. 
and they are, are seeking out who might be the next apostle. So what were their qualifications? Well, the ones that are mentioned there is they had to be men who had been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. They had walked with Jesus from the beginning. They had to have witnessed his ministry and they had to have witnessed his resurrection from the dead. That's why we know there's none of these guys around anymore. No one meets these qualifications today. And if anybody claims to, well, I'll leave it up to you to do what you will with that claim. I'd ask them these questions, though. Were you with the Lord? Did you see his resurrection? How old are you? You know? There are other things you know, we could say about the apostles, like the fact that they, they received special gifts of the Spirit. They were able to work miracles of healing, uh, like Jesus did. They were able, in fact, to, to pass that ability on to others by the laying on of hands. Uh, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God as they wrote Scripture. Yeah, we have their writings in the New Testament. The apostles were just a special gift of God to the church to get the church started, to help it to be established and build up, to teach it in its infancy and, and to build it up, and, and, and to compose the great bulk of the New Testament that we have before us today. The apostles are responsible for that. They had so many important functions, but temporary. Temporary until the church could function without these things. Uh, special role of apostle of Christ passed away with the death of the last of the twelve, which was probably John uh, at the end of the first century A.D. Many of them died earlier than that. I think John lived till near the end of the first century. Once he died, there were no more in this office. The other temporary role we want to address today, we'll do it quickly, it is the prophets. You know, when you study the scripture, you know prophets from the Old Testament, men like Isaiah and Elijah and, and so forth. But this was also a role in the New Testament, in the earliest years of God's church. Um, in both Old Testament and New Testament, the role of the prophet is to be a mouthpiece for God. That's their job. Whatever God wants them to say, they say. That's the prophet's job. Uh, sometimes, indeed, they predicted the future. But that's often given as the definition for a prophet. That's not the definition of a prophet. Sometimes God gave them things to say about the future. But sometimes he just gave them messages to his people. Uh, there was a man, for example, in uh, the book of Acts again, chapter 11 and chapter 21, he, he, he crops up. His name is Agabus. He was a prophet. And he predicted the future. God gave him words about the future. But, but the main role of prophet is to speak the words of God. If you think about it, the early church needed that in a time before they had the scriptures. So many of you are carrying a copy of the Bible this morning. Uh, again, either a bound one or an electrified one. Um, and it's so accessible to us. We have them in the back of our chairs. And I mean, there was a time before that was available early on. What was church like in those days where you couldn't say, turn to Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians hadn't been written yet, or at least they didn't have it. So in that time period, how did God grow his people and get his people doing what he wanted them to do? That's the role in part of the prophets. Um, 
God gave the church prophets to speak his word to them. The Spirit of God moved these, peoples, these people to speak the words of God. One example of a passage on this is, is right here in Ephesians. If you're in Ephesians 4, just look at the previous chapter for a second. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Notice what Paul writes there. He says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. See how God was working, speaking through his apostles and prophets. See, in these earliest days, God inspired both apostles and prophets with the messages he wanted his church to hear. I could truly just work, work one day a week if God still did it that way. You know, some people think we work just one day a week. But uh, anyway, um, God just downloaded messages into the, into the prophets, into their minds and spirits, and the prophets relayed them to the people of God. What a wonderful gift. God gave the church a needed gift. And to think, oh, that was just for them, we, we still benefit as well from this gracious act of God because if we wonder, what did they say? What did the prophets say? Read the New Testament, folks. That's largely what they said. And we can be assured that, that nothing they said contradicted what we read in these 27 books of the New Testament now because they both came from the same Spirit. They both came from the same God. Well, again, we could, we could say more about prophets today, but let me just sort of wrap up by affirming again that this role, the prophetic office, was temporary. Um, pretty much limited to the first century A.D. or very soon thereafter. And Paul himself predicts this. You might recall, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians 13, Paul, Paul wrote these words. He said, as for prophecies, they will pass away. That's verse 8, 1 Corinthians 13. Why would prophecies pass away? Because... This came along. And once the scriptures were collected, fully written, and available to all, there was no longer any need for that role in the church of God. There was no longer any need for special revelation to certain individuals, because everybody had the revelation of God. Fully related to his people. Again, you can probably go home and turn the TV on or the internet or, or whatever and hear somebody in the religious world today claim that they're receiving a special message from God. God put this on my heart last night to bring to you today a special message. Folks, they do so without New Testament authority. Be suspicious because often what they say contradicts the clear teaching of the New Testament. That means they're false prophets. Pay attention. Listen to people with your Bible open. Listen to me with your Bible open. I'm not asking you just to take this because I'm up here. Check it out in Scripture. These apostles and prophets were a gift of God to the church. They helped the church get started and established. They helped them to get on the same page, you might say. Um, they helped them unify and be built up and become mature, just like Paul said they would there in our passage in Ephesians chapter 4. And, and remember, above all things, their purpose was to help equip the members of 
of the body, to help equip the saints for what? Don't make me go back and re-preach this sermon. <laughs> to equip the saints for service. service, for the work of ministry. That's what it's all about. That's, that's what we do. These that we talked about today were temporary first century offices, but they still benefit us. Next time the Lord blesses us with an opportunity, we're going to start to look at um, these, these roles and offices that we still have today, because we still have several, and what God intended for those roles, and how important they are to us, and how we have some decisions to make about them in coming weeks. Thank you for listening so carefully this morning. Let's pray real quick. Dear God, thank you for today. Pray you'll bless us with, with safety as we travel, but um, that you'll protect us most of all from the evil one and keep us close to your son and uh, deep into your word as we seek your wisdom. Pray your blessing on each one here today. Everyone has their own special needs and need a blessing from you. We pray you will grant that and that you'll help us to be a blessing to one another. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior, we pray in his name. Amen. Again, today we close with an invitation. Jason is going to lead us in another song. If we can pray with you, serve you, if we can baptize you into Christ today, or we'd celebrate to see that, or, or help you in any way, please let us know what it might be while we stand, while we sing this.